want to do today is to talk about the sequel to the, the rise of Velasco, <coughs> and that was his decline. Uh, the period from 1973 to 1975 saw the quite rapid decline of the Velasco regime. When Velasco fell in, in February 1973, the regime was still energetically pursuing its program of reforms, and the economy was still growing at full tilt. 1973 was actually quite a good year for the uh, Velasco government. Um, by 1975, although the worst was yet to come, uh, the whole experiment with military radicalism looked like failing. And uh, with the time that Velasco was overthrown in the winter, of the Southern Hemisphere winter of that year, it was clear that the experiment of a left of centre military government had struck major problems. As soon as he became president, Morales Bermudez uh, embarked on a much, more, much less radical course of action. Um, he was rather roundly disrespected for doing so, according to some of the previous papers we've seen. But uh, it seems to be fair to say that he didn't really have a lot of choice. Um, and that uh, in Velasco's typical sort of direct Barrowman's way, he gave an interview with Caritas in 1977 and disabused himself of his thoughts of, of the situation in Peru at that time as it's too little miedo or a viejo. And I have to say, I think that was a pretty fair summing up of the situation a year or so after Velasco had left power. So why the decline? What, what was responsible for the um, failures of the later period of Velasco? Um, we've had some interesting presentations this afternoon and, and indeed yesterday. And uh, it's worth building on some of them, certainly as far as the issue of, of pantalones or cojones is concerned. Um, <laughs> But um, I think what I want to do is to use a, a comparative and a historical perspective to try and get some slightly different insights into the Velasco government. Um, we can start with the notion that military conservatism is normal in Latin America and in Peru, um, and that it's the victory of the radicals in Peru from 68 and 69, and not their defeat in 76, the principally need explaining. It's certainly the case that the number of conservative military regimes in Latin America has historically greatly exceeded the number of left-wing ones. And um, certainly, to get a sense of why the, the radicals won, you need a historical and a, and a comparative dimension. And the same sort of thing helps us understand, I think, why the left-wing government of, of Velasco had a limited short life, short shelf life. Um, one reason for that, comparatively speaking, is that there were major changes in the world between 1968 and 1973. In 1968, the world seemed like a unipolar place. The Americans were overwhelmingly dominant in Latin America, <coughs> rather overbearing, and bitterly resented by a lot of Peruvian and other intellectuals and nationalists. By 1973, there had been a number of serious setbacks suffered by the US uh, in the, the world as a whole. Um, 1973 was the year of the Watergate, certainly the year of the Watergate blue. And the American president became something of a laughing stock uh, for quite a number of people for quite a long, quite a long time. Um, there was the Yom Kippur War broke out in October of 1973. The Americans did not lose that military did the, 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 the Israelis, but they did lose it economically. That was a period of the um, embargo on oil to the United States and a sharp increase in the international oil price. And again, although the United States was not the only loser in that process, in fact, Europe lost by more. <coughs> in terms of prestige, it was a bad period for the United States. In internal US political terms, the effect of all this was to weaken the US presidency. It was certainly something that someone, a historian like Arthur Schlesinger wrote about the imperial presidency in the early 70s on the, putting forward the argument that the American presidency was over powerful. It was hard to make that case in 1974-75. And um, it was quite clear that there had been a sea change in the way that the US was able to participate in, in but in enforcing regime change in Latin America. <coughs> there was an amusing exchange of views 
perhaps even a slightly gallant exchange of views between Kissinger and Pinochet in 1976, when Kissinger visited Chile and had a chat with, with his friend General Pinochet. And two things emerged. One was Pinochet put some of his list of concerns, the Peruvian arms build up, I'll talk more about this later. But the Chileans may have been in part uh, trying to deflect attention from their human rights behavior by making a fuss about uh, Peruvian military aggression. But I think there was an element of truth in Pinochet's concerns that um, Chile was less well armed than Peru and was facing the potential for um, a difficult situation should the Peruvians decide to do anything drastic, which in the end they didn't do. And second of all, um, Pinochet was asking the Kissinger for support in the event of um, the attack in Chile. And Kissinger kept on replying, you can, man you can manage in that situation, you can hold out, you you're, you're all right. Um, but Pinochet was saying, well, they needed the Americans to support them with, with weaponry. And um, Pinochet was saying, and Kissinger was saying, well, I can't do that, Congress won't let us anymore. Um, there are all sorts of restrictions on what we can do. We're in a minority in the, in the Congress. There's um, all sorts of problems we have with our own policy making. So you have to make it out on your own. Now, maybe that was Kissinger selling cheap and, and buying dear and making things look more difficult than they actually were. But again, I think there's a grain of truth in that. Um, certainly by the mid-70s, the Chilean government was weaker uh, because its ally in the United States was weaker, and, Ch and the, the US had suffered some major setbacks of credibility. And that, I think, made um, <coughs> the Peruvian situation different because there was a, a gradually decreased political benefit from economic nationalism and from nationalization of IPC and, and the Manhattan companies in particular. In 1968, the IPC case was pivotal in allowing the uh, emergence of a, military, of a military government. And there's not much doubt, I think, that the IPC was in itself a major issue and not just uh, an excuse for military action. And um, the IPC issue gave Velasco a chance to differentiate his product from those of the other military officers in Peru at that time and come out on top in the past struggles that followed. Um, I had the doubtful good pleasure of spending half an hour in the company of the black angel of the Peruvian right, Pedro Beltran. And he spent his, most of his time denouncing Velasco and Morales from Rio de Janeiro in 1975, 76, and saying what horrible people they were and how they mistreated the poor guy and, and the conversation in the newspaper. And finally, when I could get in the word, I said, well, look, you may not like him, but how do you explain his political, his political success? And he looked at me and said, guts. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there is some truth in, in that. I mean, he, he was able to distinguish himself from Belaunde, who was seen at the time as a nice man with no real political courage at all, and a man who was unwilling to put his um, fortune to the political test. And Velasco also held uh, to of Montagne, who was one of the coup leaders and was reckoned to be the man in political charge of the succession. And Velasco faced him down, and Montagne in the end decided not to pursue his challenge to, to Velasco. And that was probably the decisive period when the military radicals won their political victory over the uh, more moderate national, maybe nationalists, but, but rather boring middle of the road sort of officers such as Montagne. But the victory of the nationalist left was, I think, something with a limited shelf life. It did a lot of good for Velasco at the time. In 1973, there were some CIA reports which I was able to access on the issue of Sarah de Pasco. And the CIA was saying, well, Fernandez Maldonado, who was in his own eyes, the success of Velasco, the potential success of Velasco, was going to use the nationalization of Sierra de Pasco as a kind of IPC, as a kind of cost and labor for nationalization, which would, he hoped, grab, gain political support 
um, in his own interest, and he had to emerge as a, front, uh, as a replacement for General Velasco when the time came. And so, Morales, Fernandez Martinez had in mind uh, a very dramatic nationalization of Cerro de Pasco, and it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because Mar Morales Bermudez, the finance minister, wouldn't have it. Well, maybe more of that later. Um, but it was also the case of, in the crisis, Velasco backed Morales Bermudez and didn't back Fernandez Maldonado. And that was um, significant. And I suspect it's because Velasco didn't think that the, um, a major confrontation with the United States at that time would pursue root interest or suit its popularity. And consequently, they settled for kicking the issue into the long grass uh, and did some comprehensive deal. Um, with, a, with a comprehensive compensation settlement, which was announced at the end of, of, of 1973. And then a couple of years later, there was another high profile nationalisation, which was the takeover of Marcona in 1975. And that didn't do anything for the military government. It, it, it's clear that the political support that came from nationalisation was um, on the way down. The same could be said about the diminishing political value of anti Americanism generally. Um, Velasco made it a personal mission to take on the US over the Kinnick Amendment. And uh, that, that was a process by which the Americans were required to cut off aid to Peru and to announce the fact. And there was a fear that had the US taken a big stick attitude towards Peru in that way, um, this would be damaging to Peru's image in the rest of Latin America, sorry, the US image in the rest of Latin America, and would um, complicate relations across the entire hemisphere. Um, in fact, the US cut off aid anyway, uh, but nobody took any notice because they did it in a no very far sort of way um, that uh, didn't involve humiliation of Peru. In fact, the Peruvians looked as if they won that particular battle. Whether they have or not is perhaps disputable, but certainly Velasco got kudos from selling up to the Americans over a kicking or whatever the final result may well have been. And after 1973, there was much less of the idea of a confrontation with the US. Um, one has a feeling that, that Kissinger was quite happy with Velasco in power after the after financial settlement in 1973. Kissinger wasn't interested in democracy, and, there were, and Velasco was quite happy, quite willing to carry on with his domestic reforms and domestic expropriations, providing he left uh, international issues aside, which was something that Velasco understood and acted upon. In fact, if you look at who got hurt with the nationalizations of the Velasco period, uh, it was mostly domestic Peruvian enterprise, um, not foreign capital which was nationalized at times, but uh, got compensation and was able to use um, political support from America to get what he needed. So the anti-Americanism and anti-IPC attitude of the American government, um, which uh, gave Velasco a lot of help at the beginning of his career, at uh, the beginning of his government, um, ceased to be so important by the early 1970s. And by 1975, it ceased to be a real asset for the government. It was something that was perhaps yesterday's issue and was not um, a fundamental part of the Velasco government strategy. And there wasn't much to be gained from continuing that line. Second issue that contributed, I think, to its decline was the over-militarization of the regime's organization and psychology. The dramatic emergence of a nationalist military regime under Velasco marked the culmination of two different trends. One was the military's quest for autonomy. The fact that the U US was putting pressure on Peru in various ways was not well received. Um, somebody spoke yesterday about the issue of Nepal um, and the Peruvian military wanting access to the, the, the Papilla refinery to, 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 to construct Nepal to put down the, the La Puente rising of 1965 and they weren't given it an objective. Now you might want to ask why a series of military officers who a few years later were radically speaking in favour of the peasantry and in favour of um, social justice were anxious to get out of Nepal a few years earlier. Well, it was a slightly um, 
a kind of confusion of identity here, I didn't know. Uh, but the issue, I think, was autonomy and the military's desire to be autonomous of the United States. I did have the um, interesting pleasure of, of an afternoon with General Jose Graham in the 1981, and I asked him about Kain and whether that was fundamental to the Velasco government. He said, no, not really. Um, the main Velasquista radicals had never been to Kain. What it was, was the creation of a, a, a corporate identity which was important. And Khan was seen as an alternative to the military, US military training college in Panama, which ground where I reckon were a bunch of charlatans who didn't know anything about military discipline. Whether that is the case, I'm in no position to judge the, 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 the case. Um, the, the issue of military autonomy and the general value, value to the military of, of their own uh, way of looking at the world were fundamental to what happened. The other was a military conf confidence in its superiority over those civilians. Um, and I remember speaking to the Peruvian historian Victor Villanueva, to whom I have a great letter of debt, by the way, and may he um, rest in peace. Um, and I said to him, is it true that um, the military in Peru had a desire to rule the country in any event? He said, no, not a desire, a duty. It was they, they saw themselves as the rightful governors of Peru and civilian rule, even democratic rule, as kind of an unwelcome interlude that wouldn't last very long and wasn't very important. And the key issue was the military um, and the way it conducted itself. So one could see the way in which the military gained confidence in the 50s and 60s through Kain and through um, some of the intelligence community. And it can be seen in terms of a variety of, of ways, principally in terms of the ambition of the Alaska government. Um, I don't think other earlier regimes, like Godoy or Adria, no matter how tempted they've been, no matter how anxious they've been to distinguish themselves from the US, would have taken on the US over you see, in the way that the Alaska is here. I think it's more a mood change, and a change in, in new, new music that was responsible for the um, change in, in military attitudes in Peru, and not so much um, a change in doctrine or anything of that nature. Okay, so the military then takes power, and it's then got to govern. Military rule is certainly not uncommon in Latin America at that time, but most civilians, most military regimes rather, concluded some civilians that had over to government, with the exception of Velasco, whose cabinets were all military. If you look at um, Pinochet, Onganilla, Videla, Brazil's various military regimes, they all had civilians in the cabinets. And they found that this was helpful to them because it meant that the military didn't have to take the blame for everything that went wrong. Um, something like uh, Onganilla put in Craig of Bessania as finance minister, there were riots in Cordoba in 1969, Cordoba was saying it was fired, and a new finance minister was put in his place. Something rather similar happened with Martinez Dios and Videla's Argentina. But Velasco very heavily militarized the government, and um, his approach to doing that made it more difficult for him to deflect blame when things started to go wrong. But at the same time, some military governments, not all, had elections within some sort of constrained existence within authoritarian government. Pinochet famously had two plebiscites, one in 1978, one in 1981. Uh, 1978 was a wonderfully slanted form of wording with you support the patriotic government of General Pinochet against the nasty, subversive influences of Amnesty International, it was pretty much like that. Uh, and we were rather addictive, we actually won those plebiscites. The Uruguayan military had a plebiscite on their own future in office and they managed to lose it. It didn't be the power very quickly, but they, they lost their own plebiscite, which is quite good going. Um, and in Brazil, there were civilian, the civilian elections of all sorts of through much of the 20 years of military government, military dictatorship. Velasco didn't hold elections of any kind, and 
didn't see any need for them. He was um, rather unhappy with the idea of civilian government having any, any role in, in that at all. And um, so he, de he deprived himself of his possible safety valve so that when things started to go wrong, um, he and his military people were fair and square in the, in the firing line of civilian disapproval. There wasn't a possibility of doing a decent thing of firing subordinate. That's happened in Argentina several times and could have happened in Peru if they had civilians in, in power. In addition, Velasco didn't face any term limits. Now, I explain in, in my article, I think you probably mostly know how the succession was organized. Um, Velasco seized power with the head of a hunter, and he had a power struggle with the head of the, the Air Force in October of 68, which he won, and he was able to put his own base man in the Air Force as well as being head of the winter himself. And when the question of, Italian, of Velasco's several numbers came up into existence in January 1969, the issue was whether there should be a term limit on the Velasco period of government. And Velasco persuaded Montagne not to object to a, a two to one vote with the Air Force and the Army, saying that there shouldn't be, that they had a kill. The army should not have to retire at the end of his period of, of, of retirement day. He could carry on in, in office forever. And that meant that there was another possible way of, of, of contrasting with other regimes in the region. And that is um, blocking the, the possibility of a succession. Now, not every South American government had a system by which the head of government had a term limit. But it did happen in Brazil, it did happen in Argentina, it did happen uh, after the referendum in Chile with the um, new constitution. So, and that too blocked a means of resolving conflict within the regime. If Velasco had in 1969 been given a fixed term of office, say five years, he would have been succeeded in, 19, in 1974, maybe 1975, it would have been six years. And that would have made it possible for people who were unhappy with Velasco um, because of his, his illness and loss of time generally um, without having to form a conspiracy to overthrow him. They, it was much more likely had he been going to go in 74, 75 that officers who didn't like him and looked at their calendar signed they only created in three or eight days to go. Um, we can survive it for that period of time. And so for that reason, I think the, the absence of term limits was an issue that blocked the not to lead to resolving conflict within the regime. Um, we can't be sure it would have mattered, but it might have done. If we look at the way in which the Velasco's Peru was actually organized, it seems like something that was designed to enable a radical majority minority to dominate a non-radical majority. It didn't always work. There were major conflicts with the uh, Air Force, major conflicts with the Navy, um, but I can't think of any case where the Navy or the Air Force of any Latin American country has defeated the army in the power struggle. And it almost always goes the other way. And he went that, the other way, that way in that direction. And Velasco managed the army in a way that was also a way of, of looking for potential rivals and making sure that they weren't able to mobilize anything to threaten him. There was an element of divide rule about his military command structure. And some of his governance strategies were made to look professional and bureaucratic, even when they were biased and clearly partisan. Um, when I, if I use the word co-op, you will understand what I mean. Um, it was, in theory, a technical committee designed to look at the merits or demerits of particular policy measures. But in fact, it was the forcing house of the Velasco reforms, and it was a place where the radical colonels of 68 were able to gain experience of government before moving up into power in 69 and thereafter. So, it's, in, it's, it's ironic that um, the phrase bureaucratic authoritarian was used by O'Donnell to discuss places like Argentina and perhaps Brazil. And yet, certainly Argentina was very unbureaucratic authoritarian. It was authoritarian, but it wasn't very bureaucratic, it was actually very political. Uh, the country that was most bureaucratically run under Velasco was Peru Velasco. Uh, 
And that was not treated as bureaucratic authoritarian. Um, although, as I said, I think the famous maxim of O'Donnell works very rather well and um, could perhaps be reconsidered in that light. So we have a, a regime that was broadly unpopular with the rest of the military and which was governing for a reasonably successfully <coughs> but without too many safety valves, without too many seat valves. And um, as a consequence of that, when things started to go wrong, there was a brittleness about the regime, which made it difficult to um, survive the, the consequences of, of a, uh, an illness. I've got a family. Velasco himself changed character in 74 75, and um, that was clearly the result of his illness, and it made it difficult for him to govern effectively. More important, perhaps, he lost the support of the military radicals, of the people who were actually behind the 68 coup, and who moved into senior positions thereafter. They had came, were coming to despair of Velasco and regarded him as, as a liability at the end. And, um, Took the, took the view that he had to go. I had an interesting take on this from General Brown in, in Lima um, when he said that the military radicals in which he was clearly one had come to the conclusion more in sorrow than anger that Velasco wouldn't do anymore and they had to get rid of him and launch a coup. And they approached Morales Bermudez as coup leader and Morales agreed to join in the conspiracy. And Graham and Co were then very surprised when the coup took place because the people most associated with it nothing to do with the military radicals at all. And that uh, Morales Bermuda is a kind of a wife and a mistress, if I can put it that way. He, he was um, in, a rela in a political relationship with the military radicals, but he was in a political relationship with more conservative people as well. And he was able to use his double support to move through to the right after 75. And after 76, there was no longer uh, um, Military, radical military government in Peru. Also worth mentioning were international factors with the Chilean coup. Um, mentioned several times in the discussion in the last couple of days. Um, the Peruvians have an ancestral dislike of the Chileans. Um, it's not primarily a political thing. And it made it difficult for Velasco and Allende to get together to any common purpose during the early 70s, when you would think that a, a combined strategy vis-a-vis -vis the US might have paid dividends, but ancestral dislikes of the two countries made that virtually impossible. And once Pinochet had seized power in Chile, um, there were issues to do with um, unsatisfactory relations with Peru, which hurt Peru in some ways. They cost quite a lot of money, and certainly Peru had budgetary problems coming into the late 70s. They raised political tensions. I mean, in the end, the war never came. And I think it probably, the smart money would, be, would have been on it not coming. But you could never read out. And there was always a possibility that um, somebody somewhere would fire a gun and think something would happen uh, in a serious way. Perhaps more significant than any of that was a change in political balance in the region. Not only was the, the far right victorious in Chile, they were also victorious in Argentina. Um, there's, been, uh, there's traditionally been a close fraternal relation between, between Peru and Argentina and the Velasco people were interested in Peronism in its leftist stage in, in 73, 74 but as Peronism moved to the right so Velasco's people had one fewer sort of international support on which to rely and um, with the victory of the right in Uruguay as well and continued military government in Brazil, it was clear that the political balance within Latin America moved to the right. Whereas in 68, um, there were talk, there was talk of revolution and the, the left had hopes of success in a number of countries. By 75, no longer the case. Um, the right was triumphant across the region as a whole. But the one country where the right was not triumphant in any great extent was the United States. Um, but that's uh, another issue. And then 
I think I'll make it finally, um, there was the issue of the economy. Um, moving from military issues to civil military ones. Um, the Velasco government made a number of mistakes in terms of its economic management. Um, it might have got away with them if its oil exploration policy had been more successful. As it was, they invested an enormous amount of money in an oil pipeline across the Andes to carry oil from the jungle to the coast. There was a bit of oil to carry, but not very much. And on the whole, that venture was a disappointment in the training. Um, and since the Peruvians got a low interest loan in yen, this was not a clever thing to do in the short run, in the long run, because in the short run, low interest rates were helpful and the availability of money was helpful. In the long run, debts in yen have a habit of going up in value. And um, certainly don't do anything for the exchequer in the longer run. Um, the Peruvians under Garcia later on sought to renegotiate the oil pipeline in terms with Japan. And they had this meeting and the Japanese sat down on the table, uh, the Peruvians at the other side of the table. The Peruvians had that position, the Japanese politely said, we can't help you. And one of the Peruvian negotiators said, I am malditos chinos, without realizing that the Japanese could speak Spanish perfectly well. <laughs> so the negotiation was both a great success. <laughs> But uh, the Peruvian military in, under Velasco carried out a classic ISI sort of policy with uh, price controls, uh, controls of the price of gasoline and, and food, um, protectionism, and um, a number of popularity seeking ventures that were good in the short run for tactical reasons, but not really much happened in, in the long term uh, for strategic uh, development. And, um, the British ambassador in 1973 made a judgment that, and I quote, fearful of its popularity, the government is trying to shed, shield the Peruvian consumer as much as possible from world, from world economic realities. And this was happening at a time when real wages were falling. Real wages peaked in 1973, went down in 74, and by 77, 78, were well down and where they had been. And that's when the mobilization of the distant people were. Um, was reaching its peak. So how do we conclude? Well, I think if you look at serious left wing governments in the region, you look at Cardenas, you look at Chavez, you look at Castro, you look at Perón, and with a bit of stretching, you look at Velasco. And they all did m major things and had major achievements to their credit, but they all left the place in a mess, um, essentially for financial reasons. And um, Velasco, I think, follow, follows the, the pattern um, that um, has been followed more recently by someone like Chavez. Um, dr drama, uh, certainly making people aware of political possibilities that weren't aware of before, but uh, in the end, an economic mess, which had subsequent governments have got to clear up. Uh, and finally, Chavez himself was asked what he thought of Velasco. He said, I admired him. Um, he was, uh, he, he had his heart in the right place because he left a political popular strategy. And that, I think, is fair comment. Chimbote played a big role in the downfall of Velasco, especially financially, uh, with first the reconstruction program after the earthquake, uh, costing a lot of money that they hadn't budgeted for. Uh, and secondly, the uh, fishing industry and then the probable mistake of not only paying the, the expropriated fisheries uh, or uh, industrialists for their property, but also paying for their debt as well, assuming their debt as part of the expropriation. I was wondering if you thought that would have any impact. Well, first of all, the nationalization bears in mind my contention that, first of all, nationalization has a short political shelf life. The regime did not get a nationalization bonus from nationalizing the fishing industry at all. 
And second of all, that if you're a foreigner, you had a better chance of getting compensated than if you're a domestic um, capitalist. Uh, as far as the politics of Djibouti, I think I'd be interested in hearing more about Tantalia. Uh, I think I asked a question about that this morning. Um, <coughs> he was denounced as a right winger, uh, perhaps for good reason. He was certainly an authoritarian figure, but then so was Vanasco. Uh, and he was a nationalist in, in economic terms, as was Vanasco. And he was uh, a believer in verticality down or top down politics, as is to some extent with Vanasco. And yet, yeah, Velasco is a hero of the left, and tell him that he hasn't seen it in the fascist. Uh, go figure, I don't really understand it. <laughs> I'm wondering how, how you would explain and understand uh, the events that Adrian told us about today. You know, there's no outpouring of support for Velasco in 75, yet in 77, when things are worse, there's this sort of huge outpouring. How, how do you make sense of, of the, the response to his death, especially in comparison to the fact that, that there was really no mobilization to defend him when he was overthrown in 75. Well, I think, first of all, if you look at real wages, your father went down between 75 and 77 quite significantly. Um, there was a major demonstration come strike in Lima in July 1977. Uh, I had to be there at that time. And it was quite uh, very substantial, very, very big. And clearly, it did support, it, it did. Um, reflect public opinion to an extent. I mean, obviously there's no evidence of self-selection, but that's kind of supporters. And at the same time, I think perhaps it's also the truth that Velasco was close to his finishing date by the time he was overthrown. And he was overthrown by people who were promising to not more of the same. And by 77, they weren't going to get more of the same. There was an alliance with Accra. There was a promise of democracy. There was free market economics, or at least economic stabilization of an orthodox kind. And um, the idea of a left wing re regime was really over. And consequently, <coughs> I guess people who in 75 were willing to give Morales Bermuda the benefit of the doubt, by 77 were not. And um, I mean, there were supporters of Velasco in the, in, the, in the military. They weren't able to prevail, but they did exist. And they were able to make themselves felt in the streets now and again as well. How, how would you explain the um, relative lack of state violence during the Velasco period, um, particularly in, in comparison to what had already happened in Brazil and then would happen in, in Chile and in Argentina? Well, the state was not short of violence when it was in Nepal in 1965. Um, I mean, I think. But that was better, wasn't it? That was, that's quite true. Uh, but it was also the military which was doing its own thing to an extent. Um, no, I think the military does not like or did not like internal repression as part of its, its objective. And if it could avoid doing so, it would, would avoid doing so. Um, I suspect there were connections between the civilian left and Velasco's branch of the military in 68. I don't have data on that. But um, a number of people from the civilian left got positions in the Velasco government rather early on in proceedings. More than you would have expected had they had to hunt around for, for people that, that weren't work with them. I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't negotiations of some sort between someone like Fernandez Valdinale uh, and the civilian left. And the civilian left would almost certainly have said, well, we don't want to be repressed out of Chile. Can you give us assurances on that? That would be my guess, but I don't have any inside knowledge of that. Yes. Yeah, what was uh, the difference in economic sense uh, uh, between after Velasco and before Velasco? Well, before Velasco, um, Peru was a classic capitalist country with the exception of protectionism, which was ISI. Uh, but Peru had not had a nationalist left-wing government uh, or an ISI government before Velasco. Um, they had people like Adria who were free market liberals. And you can argue that um, the policy of free market economics was running out of steam by the time of the digital power in 68. Um, afterwards, it depends which period you're talking about, but um, I would have thought that Belloni II um, was a free market liberal of a pretty classic variety. Um, and 
the only very successful one, but that was partly because of native ineptitude, and partly because of problems with the, uh, the there was a downside in the earthquake and various things happening at an environmental time. But um, I think if you were if you were saying what 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 do you think just Kuzey shows Kuzey shows the map shows, you may be partly right. Uh, sure. right, sorry, uh, my memory may be a fault, but uh, one thing I, I seem to remember as being a turning point in terms of both of our decisions for last year was the nationalisation of the Daily Press. Um, I, I was waiting for a mention of that and it didn't come. No, um, I should perhaps have mentioned it, but also the, the police strike mm -hmm. of January, February 1985, 1985, sorry was significant. I mean, the whole thing still things that are going wrong. You can list them if you like. But the general point was that the, the, the regime was losing popularity, losing its different directions. And with one of the important exceptions, such as the recognition of Quechua, uh, the regime wasn't making any social progress either. Um, on the contrary, its synonymous policy was a super failure. And um, a military hard life was kind of in, in, incipiently emerging to take advantage of the the failure of the participation strategy. But um, you're right, the, the, the newspaper we were an issue. And um, who wants to read newspapers run by the military? <laughs> Not obviously anybody now, no. I thought your point about Basco having a purely military cabinet is a very telling point. And because all the other regimes you cited, as well as Iberians, like Franco and Salazar, had technocrats and important mm -hmm. Um, in important portf portfolios. Um, how far down in the case of uh, Belasco did you have to go to find a competent technocrat? Uh, the ministers were all military men, and I think that the level beneath, beneath you below them were. What, was it below that that you found competent economists, etc.? I think it was below that. I mean, Petro, Brad, Petro Peru had five military officers running it. So you'd be about mid-level bureaucracy before you could, you could find a civilian. Right. Um, yeah. And the, the finance ministry a bit less so. There would have been people, I think, at sub subsecretary level who would have been um, civilian. But even so, it was an unusually militarized government. And there was, um, it became more, became more so over time. And of course, they, the military would draw double salaries, which would um, not please the civilians who were observing this going on. Um, there was no real issue of corruption at the beginning of the Velasco period, at least not to public knowledge, although there, there, there were other anecdotes. Um, but by the end, there certainly was a talk of corruption. Uh, the other thing I found very interesting was, uh, I've forgotten this, was that the, the, the Velasco military regime didn't modify its language with respect to civilians. So some of the phrases are exactly the same as you found from right-wing military regimes about the unworthiness of civilians and not understanding the greatness of the ideals. And um, it, one can think of things in in Bolivia, for example, or Vando and the sort of military that he brought in. We said pretty much identical things from a, 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 an extreme right-wing military point of view. Yes, uh, I mean Velasco's dislike of civilian politicians was, was quite genuine. I don't think there's any suggestion that he put that on for effect. And um, it certainly permeated the regime to a considerable extent in a way that didn't happen so much in some of that Brazil. Um, it may well be that um, Kaim played a part in persuading military officers that they were the elite, a bit like Eaton in Britain, as was once the case. Um, and it may have had that indirect effect rather than a direct indoctrinatory effect which um, I don't think he did have. Um, Villain Weyman puts it saying that the military officer sees himself as civilian, uh, superior to civilians because of his discipline. Um, I'm not sure they do much in the way of discipline when it comes to launching coups and things, but uh, nevertheless that was uh, the rationalisation. There's a question at the uh, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. And uh, I was wondering what are your remarks on the foreign policy of the military government? Especially because um, there's, it seems that uh, it emphasized a lot um, the approach uh, to the G77 and the non-alignment movement. However, uh, 
uh, despite the fact that the USSR was the, the main, probably the main uh, arms supplier of the, of the regime. And uh, also if you can elaborate a little bit more uh, within the regional um, uh, context with Chile and Bolivia, um, what's the behavior internationally of the, of the regime? Okay, well the first foreign minister was Mikhailo with, with Harian, who was anxious to pursue an online policy and he did, did so to some effect. Um, a lot of it is rhetoric. I mean, doing, doing a deal with Bulgaria is not going to necessarily going to improve your stock of uh, manufacturing industry. Um, but uh, it, it's good publicity. And certainly they were saying if you attack us over IPC, we will create problems for you across the entire hemisphere. And interestingly enough, Gabriel Valdez, who was the Chilean foreign minister, uh, was quoted as saying to Kissinger that if you, if you were too heavy with Peru, you'll have problems across the region. Um, which was knew that had a bit of barrel, I think. Um, thereafter, uh, Perez de Cuellar was involved in the policy making of, period of, uh, of that period and certainly pushed an online policy um, in a quite an effective way. Um, and yes, there were economic nationalists sort of, with respect to the Andean group as well. Uh, but the Andean group um, suffered a setback with the Chilean coup and he was really sort of from the from the group. Um, and the Venezuelans, who could have made it work, never took it all that seriously. Um, so, in aspirations on the line, in diplomatic terms quite effective, in economic terms not so great. <laughs> right. Well, I, so I'm looking to more structural, sort of central structural things. I do think that, I mean, in the way what you're, what I thought you were saying is, that in the end, it didn't leave much of a legacy, but the land reform, really a fantastic change in this country. In a way, the way it happened maybe set maybe set Peru on quite a different path from other countries because on one hand obviously it broke I mean it really was quite radical and it broke the back of the of a certain categories of the land it believed and opened the way to a kind of eventually to a kind of middle class. But it also had the lateral effect of, of, of giving rise to Sendero on one hand because Sendero starts with young people who are disenchanted with the authoritarianism of the implementation of the reform. But on the other hand, because, maybe because of the moment in which it happened, because they didn't open their way to an indigenous um, sort of uh, rhetoric as some other people have done, um, especially later, it may also have had that, plus the Sendero, it may have had an effect on the absence of indigenous mobilization, especially in the islands of Peru. So really, that could have been structurally, I think, was really important. Yeah, no, I think I would agree with that. Um, I'm a bit taken with your thought that people joined in there because they were afraid that it's like the authoritarianism of the government. Well, that's uh, how it starts, isn't it? <laughs> but that, that reservation about a path, I think I would agree with you. I mean, I think that's why I use Cardinals as an example of someone who is uh, a comparator. Yeah. What you're saying is the Sendero, because they were equally authoritarian, why would they? That was back for years, but that works too. Yeah, well, obviously they did become very different. The stories I've read, other than even better, is that it started as an opposition to the way in which the government was running the land reform property. That's how it started. The rest is history. Uh -huh. But they also were very hostile to an indigenous rhetoric. There. Well, they would be, wouldn't they? Yeah. The classic nineteen days with a person is needed here. Yeah, my question has to do with actually some of the topics we discussed in the in the previous panel, and has to do with present day perceptions about Velasco. And, and my impression, I may be wrong, but my impression is that they are highly polarized. Yeah. You know, he was either a hero of the people or the the guy that mess uh, everything and you know like in the Vargas Llosa famous phrase Jodio el Peru right um, and so I wonder how do you explain that I mean even Fujimori gets a little bit of credit <laughs> right or Pinochet for, for that matter I mean you know people that you read on blogs and things like that say yeah I mean Fujimori he, you know he was a ladron and you know violated human rights but you know he defeated Sendero he controlled inflation etc et with Velasco very rarely you see that kind of attendant, a more balanced uh, account. 
So does that have to do with uh, him being a military uh, president, with uh, you know the, the the radicalism of the land reform, the lack of uh, political party that you know carries on his his legacy? How do you explain that, that kind of um, collective? Um, it seems to be what you would expect of a, a highly polarizing figure. I mean, Charles Kenny has a book on the how to go up in 1992, and he quotes a poll saying, who, who do you most admire in Peruvian history? And the left comes out very high. He's not top, but he's, he's pretty strong. And um, there's no doubt that the minority of Peruvians think that Velasco is wonderful. Um, clearly, the same token, people who had things to do to, who, who, who think that free market economics is the solution and, and absence of free market economics for DL Peru. Um, they clearly wouldn't learn from Lasco. I mean, it's, it's, I would have thought pretty much what, 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 what one would have thought was, was likely. Uh, I guess truth is nothing easy to grab. And if we go to the website of the General Leguia, it starts saying, hated by some and loved by others, mm -hmm. which is true. Yeah. So it's quite difficult to say that. Some people love and some people hate that the year, or maybe the Laundia was stated that his funeral was massive. But I guess also as academics in here, we have to find out what might be the truth and not be led by the assumption that if people like, like in power do not uh, research by internet in, in, in this. Uh, comments of some people saying whatever they want to say uh, ever, uh, even they don't know what I'm saying or <coughs> have to take into account the background I, I suppose, I, I will guess that most of the people want to say that he did wrong because I, I, I can imagine that working people peasants, peasants, they don't have internet and they have to look for the food every day rather than commenting on the internet so we cannot assume that some people hate and some people love. That's a, a balance situation for somebody, whatever he is, whoever he is. No, I don't think I was to say it was a balance. I think on the whole, he does rather better than some leaders of Peru. I mean, certainly Ana Garcia the first or Belo they come out weaker. Um, but, I mean, he, he, he clearly was a polarizing figure. I mean, he left he, nice property. He fought the Americans. Uh, Morally, anyway, um, he set up participatory agencies that, that might have worked, although they didn't. And at the same time, his economic policies were not successful. They might have succeeded under different assumptions, but uh, in the end, he bequeathed uh, both the famous crisis to a successor, which took quite a headache to, to, to resolve. So I would have thought that, that, that that was pretty much what you would have expected under the circumstances. Uh. So I think an important point that you mentioned is that the loss of confidence by the radical uh, military in 74, 75. Mm -hmm. I wonder at what level is that sort of decision or that sort of politics made? Is it just generals plotting or conspirating or is it, does it have any relationship with the rank and file of the army or with the perception of popular support or is it just that they fall, fall out in the last one, like the important general? That's a very good question. I wish I knew the answer. Um, I think that there's probably an element of, of hierarchies in the military. You can expect that. Um, and Morales Bermudez was certainly um, seen as being acceptable to people who later repented their choice. Um, and Fernandez Maldonado and Brown and people were, and, and, and Rodriguez Figueroa were certainly didn't change their views about what was desirable. They were still on the left. And there were certainly signs of left wing support for General Velasco at lower down the, the, the military scale uh, of a significant nature. But at the end of the day, um, the people who won out were the, were, were the military right. Can I share? Uh, when uh, the Buddha was interviewed about the coup d'etat, he said that a bunch of generals were drinking in Tacna. And they woke up in Goblin Palace. And he couldn't explain why and how come it happened. <laughs> and, and also that uh, Montesinos, 
uh, two year, uh, two days earlier was found uh, guilty of um, betraying the country, uh, traitor, because he was uh, found as a spy of Chile, but at the same time of uh, USA. So two days later, he was about to be exiled. Um, Exam. Shut down. Yeah. Exactly. And, and then uh, the night before, uh, Bermudez uh, uh, did the coup d'etat and sent him to the United States. So just change some information. No. Yes. Montesinos was a junior officer at that time, at the time and was um, possibly an agent of the United States. We can't be sure, but it wouldn't entirely surprise me. Um, but he was faced people with deportation by the United States, I think, um, having been here, being here in the States on a scholarship. And a number of American academics, no name to that drill, intervened to try and keep, protect him and say he was a good student, he was, a, he, he was, he was doing, he would protect it on his country. And uh, he was a great guy all around. Um, this was listened to. And the deportation didn't go ahead. So when you write a reference to us, uh, that's like the where we write references for our students to be a bit careful who we write them for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think uh, we uh, perhaps should stop here and continue over a glass of wine. But please join me in uh, thanking George for. Uh,